Okay, I'm going to dive right in now that it is 11 o'clock. We'll try to start on time and we'll see how it see how it all unfolds. Uh, I was gonna I was gonna actually have a, a little uh, print going here. I'm at home uh, uh, for the duration of the time, but but ran out of some time to get that going. So I'm gonna jump right in, and we're going to talk about additive manufacturing. Uh, on campus or, or, or in your department, uh, as I feel that uh, every uh, person in every department should should own a 3D printer. There's a contact info about me. I'm a tech support specialist at Washburn, uh, and all of those uh, links are to social medias, and we'll get into what Thingiverse is, and we'll get into what Prusa printers uh, is as well. Uh, as we dive in. A brief overview of what we'll be talking about, additive manufacturing, what is it, uh, how do we do it, why we want to, uh, how we used uh, 3D printing in our COVID response, uh, and on other cool, cool stuff around campus. And then we'll try to wrap up with some questions uh, towards the end. Additive manufacturing, fancy term for uh, printing in any sort of additive fashion. There are a couple couple methods. We're gonna go over just one in particular called FDM. And I'll go into a little bit about what FDM is. And that's, that is what most people know as the, is the traditional printing, you know, 3D printing uh, process. A uh, company called Stratasys, they're still around today. Uh, they're real fancy, they make real fancy printers. They actually created the first commercially available FDM printer uh, back in the late 80s and basically uh, prevented anybody else from really innovating in the space because they, uh, because of how restricting those patents were. Uh, when those patents expired in uh, 2009, 2010 timeframe, that's when the, the, DIY community, the maker community, the consumer focused printers really started to come online. And if you look at this first, this first real jankety looking printer, that is the the first rep wrap uh, community made printer. And that was uh, a, a bunch of nerdy guys and gals took those patents, dissected them and made their own 3D printer with like hardware parts. Uh, and the idea is that a printer could replicate itself. Uh, all those white parts you see are all are all printed on a printer. So with one printer, you can make many. And that's actually still in existence today. Uh, the, the printer down there in the, the lower right hand corner, all of those black, uh, uh, most of those black pieces and all of those orange pieces are actually 3D printed and that's a commercially available product. And they have a whole farm of uh, uh, hundreds of printers just printing constantly uh, to print prints per, to print parts for their printers, uh, which is really cool. That first Stratasys printer uh, sold to con customers, you know, mostly large, large businesses, large corporations doing prototyping in the aerospace world and things like that. It sold for uh, just shy, you know, just short of uh, three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, and now that same, same, Technology can be had uh, for a consumer for uh, my first printer. I've got two at home here. Uh, I bought for $180. And it's, from a quality standpoint, considerably better than what uh, Stratasys originally developed uh, in the uh, late 80s. Uh, diving into a little bit about the process of how to get from a, an idea all the way to a physical part. Wish I should have grabbed one. I, I, actually, I got some here. We'll go into what this is, but this is a, this is a, a, an example of a 3D printed part that you would get off of a traditional FDM printer. It's made of plastics, uh, but you first have uh, you know come up with that idea. And generally, the, the where where 3D printing really excels is in areas where uh, maybe it doesn't exist. It, you know, it's a specific part or it's a specific need uh, that 
can't be purchased commercially or you need something less expensive or, or, or whatever the case may be. You have first have that idea and then uh, you either have to design it or you have to find it online. And we'll get into a little bit about that, what, what that search looks like uh, on the online space. Uh, since since the you know, less expensive community driven 3D printing world has taken off in the last 10, 12 years, uh, there are repositories where you can get just tons and tons of designs that people have made. Uh, once you have that design, uh, it's, it's generally in a file called an STL file uh, that is then, which is just a 3D model file. Uh, you bring it into a custom software called a slicer, and that is specific to 3D printing. You, know, you don't really use that software for really anything but 3D printing. And what that software does uh, is you can change your, some parameters for, for how you want that print to, to look like, how, how you want that you know, from a resolution standpoint and things like that. And then it chops up that, chops up that model into however many layers it may be. So a, a pretty common uh, printing resolution would be 0.2 millimeters. So if you have, you know, a, a, you know, something that's 10 millimeters uh, tall, uh, most of the design CAD and, and 3D printing world is on the metric metric side of things. But if you had something that was four inches tall or whatever the case may be, it chops that into layers that are 0.2 millimeters high. So you have hundreds and hundreds of layers uh, to make a, an, a, an existing or a, to make a model towards the end. Uh, and then and then from that sliced file that slices it into a, a pretty well-known file type called g-code g-code is, is real common in the cad industry for cnc routers and all kinds of all kinds of automated uh, machining tools you send it to the printer a lot of times you just plug it in with a usb or you know a little directly to the computer or wirelessly uh, that's how we use ours uh, at washburn uh, you watch it because it's really actually really fascinating to watch. I find, you know, even though I've printed a gazillion things, I find myself just watching it all the time because I think it's really neat. Uh, and then sometimes you have to wait a really long time because it's building it layer by layer by layer. Uh, it could take 20 minutes to make something small. It could take four days to make something. You know, it really depends on what that resolution setting is and uh, how big that, that model is. And then, and then the last step that, that's sometimes skipped is iterate. And iterate is uh, one of the reasons I love 3D printing and one of the reasons I think it's uh, super valuable in the workspace uh, is this iterative sort of thought process that goes into it. Uh, and, and that sort of uh, ties back into uh, that keynote yesterday about this uh, agility, about this uh, new way of thinking. Uh, if you can take something you, you quickly design something, you get it out there, you print it, it doesn't really work. It doesn't really uh, serve uh, the purpose or could serve some purpose better. You, you can quickly, very quickly, uh, iterate that design, reprint it, test it again uh, really quickly. Uh, or you can say, oh, actually, now that I'm holding it physically, I wish it was a little, a little longer, a little bigger, a little, I wish it did this cool thing. And those are super easy to add after the fact, which you can't do uh, with, you know, traditional manufacturing techniques. Brief overview of sort of the process. You have a filament, a spool of filament, which is a thin, a thin plastic, uh, generally thin plastic uh, that is fed into uh, a hot end uh, by some gears that are driven by a servo. Uh, and then that hot end is heated, you know, on, figure uh, to melt that plastic. And as it's, as the cool, cold uh, non-melted filament is getting pushed through that hot end, it's extruded through a little nozzle. And then, and then the uh, print head actually moves around to build that model. And it just keeps on going and going and going until the model is completed. Really uh, an awesome process. Uh, I had mentioned filaments before. There are tons and tons and tons of filaments. This bottom picture, uh, you may, if you guys are familiar with 3D printing, a lot of universities have 3D printers now in innovation spaces. I know there was a couple innovation space uh, presentations yesterday that I was uh, 
missed out on because I was uh, in another uh, uh, presenting in another conference or in, in another uh, meeting. But most of those, you'll see these brightly colored plastics that people make like lots of trinkets with, and and that is certainly a good use case for for three D printers. But what really excites me is uh, the functional functional parts that you can make and uh, the parts that you can design quickly and easily to better existing installations or, or whatever the case may be. And when, when we get into some of the cool projects we've done, uh, I'll show you that. But to go through some of this, this PLA filament, that's what you would, your typical education STEM focused printers are going to be printing. Uh, it's plant based. Uh, it's made of a cornstarch mostly. Uh, ABS, most people are familiar with what ABS is. It's hard plastic. Um, there are some printing concerns with that because it's a it's a, certainly not environmentally friendly, but it's also uh, toxic fumes, stuff like that. There's also metal, this top, uh, this top metal print. Uh, it actually is a PLA plastic, but it has powdered metals in it. So uh, brass, copper, steel, all these sorts of things. And you can actually, uh, it, it comes out sort of dull, but then you can polish it and it will, it will rust like normal steels and it will, it will tarnish like brass and, you know, and, and it becomes really a, a really unique piece. Uh, there's also some really strong, you know, strong filaments like nylons and fi carbon fiber reinforced nylons where you're getting uh, filaments now that are competing with uh, the traditional products. Uh, and then this uh, lower picture, the PVA, that's actually a soluble filament. So if you have a very complex design, you know, it can't, because of the, the way they printers work, they can't print in like extreme angles or if there's a cavity, you know, it can't really bridge, you know, just print over air really too well. So a, a soluble fi uh, filament uh, prints, you know, this would be a, like a dual head printer, which I can get into a little bit, but your support materials would be printed in that PVA. Uh, making your actual model really strong. And then you can dissolve that filament in water or in a chemical, uh, which is really, really, really awesome. Softwares, this may even work. This is a design that I had designed for a use case uh, at Washburn, but software, I would absolutely steer people towards uh, an Autodesk product called Fusion 360. It is super, super powerful. It's used by you know, industry uh, industry wide as a CAD program, as a 3D design program, uh, there is a bit of a learning curve uh, for sure. But if you wanted to jump in and do simple things, um, YouTube has a lot of good resources. You can pick it up pretty easily. There's a ton of stuff in Fusion that I do not know how to do, but you can still make real powerful things, uh, and it's free for education use which is uh, another big plus. You have to have a, a EDU email uh, and you, you get the education version, which is, which is the uh, fun functionally the same as the, the full, full version, which is generally uh, quite pricey. This model here, then this little video uh, is for a clear calm uh, intercom system uh, that we were installing for a SIM, a SIM lab, uh, but they, they wanted a desktop mounted option. Uh, and AutoCAD and a bunch of other integrate, you know, a bunch of other manufacturers actually have CAD uh, drawings on their website that you can just pull right in. And I just design, you know, you can easily just design your part around those CAD drawings so it will fit exactly every time. Uh, so in that video, you, you can see the, the top down view that I designed the case around uh, and then a side view to make sure we are good for clearances. Really, it's super, super awesome. Uh, program. And even if you're not interested in bringing in a 3D printer to your office or or, uh, or not, it's still uh, a great software to play around in. And this certainly takes a while to learn and certainly this, the, the learning curve uh, could be, you know, more than you want to invest in. So, so if you want something and you don't want to design it, you just want to 
like download something and print it off kind of like you would with like a traditional printer or something like that. There are websites out there. Thingiverse is a really popular one. That is a, made by a uh, company that makes a MakerBot, which is a really uh, education focused printer. Uh, they have tons and tons of user submitted designs. Same thing with prusaprinters.org. Uh, GrabCAD is an, also a great option uh, for all kinds of things. So not just 3D printed objects, but like uh, 3D models of anything. So, so I was working uh, with our union on a uh, iPad thing. And I just pulled into that Fusion 360 software uh, an iPad, you know, like a, a CAD drawing of an iPad that then we can design around. And then my mini factory is probably not super useful in the workspace. It, it has a lot of like models and uh, toys and, and, and stuff for games, stuff like that. Uh, but there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of designs out there. And then Thingiverse and Prusa printers, I've got some of the Washburn, uh, some of the models that we use at Washburn up on those sites as well. Let's talk a little bit about the why of printing and why would I want to invest time in it and why would I uh, take away time from other maybe work tasks to design something. One great uh, use and is not directly IT related, but kind of going back to what uh, uh, the keynote speaker was talking about yesterday uh, is this idea of uh, the lean. I, know I had mentioned it during that keynote uh, that the lean startup was a, a great book uh, to read uh, for this agile, quick, um, sort of ideologies and, and way of doing business. Uh, and, and one thing that, that I think is, is valuable about that in a higher ed space and in a IT space is uh, thinking outside of the box. And we'll get into some of the uh, unique things we did that were uh, direct re directly related to, uh, to those things. But, uh, generally, 3D printed stuff is pretty inexpensive. The printers are, are kind of can be pricey. Uh, you jump in a workspace environment, you probably don't want to buy the $160 printer that I have because it requires a lot of tinkering and a lot of tweaking. And we shouldn't be wasting time at work to do such a thing. But I think it's a valuable use of time to design and iterate and uh, create useful work prints, but probably shouldn't spend hours tinkering with a printer. Customizable options. I'll show you, we've been working on some wall plates to be able to provide exactly the part we need is very valuable. You can't often find, I won't go there. I'll show you, I'll show you the print and it'll make, it'll make more sense. <laughs> Uh, cost savings, single use, hard to find items. Yeah, let's just dive into some of the, uh, the prints I did and we'll see, see some of that firsthand. Uh, how we used additive manufacturing, and, I, and I'll, I'll say additive manufacturing, that's sort of a fancy word for 3D printing and it encompasses all of the different types of 3D printing. Uh, but realistically, what we were doing was manufacturing solutions. Uh, instead of just printing, you know, trinkets and things like that. Uh, one of the things we did uh, to, to improve classrooms is uh, webcam mounts. Now, this is a, uh, the, web, the webcam we were able to secure for, for classrooms and, and things like that. Most of our classrooms on campus are, are very low tech. Uh, most of the spaces didn't have cameras or microphones, things like that. So, so it was a completely you know, ground up, you know, approach. We were able to secure a bunch of these huddle cam HD webcams for all of our spaces. Uh, and the, this, this, uh, little grid, I actually got one here. I'll show you a little, little closer out different color, but, but then same, same thing functionally. And this little part clips onto the ceiling grid uh, for super, super quick, uh, installation. There's no extra extra parts or extra tools, uh, and it provides uh, 
a secure mounting for this camera that, that you know mounts just to a, a quarter 20 like tripod kind of screw. Uh, and we were able to, instead of one, we were, because we were uncertain of what sort of funds would be available, how long this was going to last, all these sorts of parameters, you know, all these sorts of things that everybody was thinking. Uh, we were able to deploy these instead of trying to find a ceiling mount for a webcam uh, and hopefully get them because all you know, everybody knows all of that stuff was super hard to come by. Uh, or even if we found an option, getting 150 of them, that's going to increase the the question mark cost that we didn't know uh, were we going to have, you know, that was before like cares was the thing that was before, you know, uh, we were just buying, buying what we could. Uh, so we ended up buying a printer for this task um, because of some of the other projects I had worked on. We, we did some uh, convincing, you know, or, or really not even convincing, just asked our CEO, can we do this? And he said, definitely. Uh, and we were able to, start printing these uh, pretty readily uh, and some of we ran into some issues with some classrooms with real tall ceilings angles were not too good and we can just print longer longer options uh, and we can our printer was churning these out plus all of our other ones uh, round the clock pretty much and the great new the great thing with this is uh, we could take it down if we move to a different solution or a more permanent solution, or, or we, you know, then got the CARES funding to funding to do, you know, some proper integration, these just unclip. Doesn't look like anything was ever there, uh, and we can do it. One person can do it, and one person can knock out a bunch of them, as opposed to you know having, which is also you know short on people, short on time, short on money. Uh, that's sort of the you know where we were finding ourselves. This is another option. We had some of those uh, web cameras left over, but document cameras we were not able to secure uh, at all. Uh, document cameras, another option, another object that is not installed in most of our classrooms. Um, we had some faculty that were taking document cameras out of classrooms. Like if we had a science sciences or a math department that had cameras in their classrooms, they were taking them and using them at home. And, you know, so so we uh, quickly kind of threw together this this model of a little webcam mount or a, or a document camera mount for that for that same camera uh, the cool thing about this is because of you know it just happened by chance really that huddle cam hd camera uh, though is not the hot you know not the the biggest uh, name brand out there they, they make some decent stuff and they actually provide a a settings application that you can you can on a computer you can change all your setting your your camera settings and then save that back to the camera, which was super super helpful uh, because we were able to flip the image you know both horizontally and vertically tweak all kinds of brightness settings tweak all kinds of you know contrast to make it to make a, a white paper really uh, really uh, a lot more visible. Uh, and then save it right to the camera. So when the user plugs it in, it's already reversed. They don't have to do all this nonsense. Uh, and it became a really good solution that we were able to deploy very quickly. So if you need one, yeah, come back tomorrow and we'll give it to you. You know, or we would just print them and have you have one or two on standby, uh, ready for people. And then as we, another important thing about that iterative process, uh, essentially this was, you know, real time A B testing where we would deploy some. And then we, I would follow back up and say, hey, what did you think about it? And, you know, what could we do to make it better? Uh, initially, it was a little too short. I was trying to keep it pretty compact uh, so they can, you know, more portable. It wasn't it really focusing on the page well. So we, we uh, made the model longer or we made, you know, we just extruded that, those you know, particular parts longer reprinted hey come back in we'll swap out the part we'll make it long. we'll make it taller we'll give you a new whole new one uh, same thing with the cable uh, cable management that you'll see uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse but uh, here in this first photo the little cable little clips uh, that was just there to, to keep that cable nice and tidy and then the final revision I don't think I have a it's not pictured here but it had a little cable wrap on the back and that's part of that, that iterative process you know instead of like oh here it's good to go how can I improve this uh, and with a little tweak, improve, you know, user 
usability and satisfaction uh, considerably in the process. I'm gonna check the time. I, I kind of running kind of blind with the uh, a PowerPoint live. Next one would be uh, the, these uh, boundary mics uh, that we got, and that was actually this this model that I showed you. Uh, a lot of our classrooms that have interactive projection, we use an Epson Brightlink or or you know some sort of interactive panel or something like that. Uh, we don't have a podium with a fixed a desktop PC. It's a laptop on an arm, which has very limited space. Uh, we were able to design these real quick for the for these uh, MX MXL uh, 404 microphones uh, that just clip right in. And then this actually slots into a a little gap in the in the actual uh, articulating arm itself, and we were able to maintain complete functionality of the laptop arm with that side table coming out. Uh, and then these cutouts. This was sort of the, the iteration on this. Other than you know, there were some tweaks to the to the size of it to make it a little more snug fit in that hole. It's, it's just a it's tapered and it. And it uh, snug fits in there. Uh, also, these cutouts help with print times, help with filament usage, things like that. And these actually have been super, super handy in in those spaces where there was no place to mount a, a microphone. Uh, so it would have been a, a diff it was a difficult challenge that was accomplished very simply with a a print that you couldn't go out and buy something like this. The webcam mount. You could certainly buy a, a probably better better webcam mount than, than than what we created, but something like this, that's really where the power of uh, this printing comes in. Is I need 30 of these, or I need 50 of these, I need 75, whatever the number is. Cool, we'll just start printing them, and and uh, and it's purpose built, and it's exactly it, it's the exact solution we needed. This is not related to COVID, but just some cool projects we've done around campus. This is a podium. That's just like your standard cable you know, hole uh, for uh, you know cables to come through uh, up at the top of the podium. Uh, that there on the left was you know in the HDMI for like a laptop connection. Our podiums have a, a sort of a center well where the monitor is, and then there's a side table which people would normally use for for laptops, and they would just there's just a cable kind of just piled up there, not super uh, attractive or user friendly. Uh, this solution uh, just modeled a uh, little insert for that so that existing hole, uh, and then we use a, a an HDMI panel mount pigtail uh, that that we were able to source uh, for. Uh, very inexpensive, you know, if we if through our uh, integrator uh, friends. Uh, and that uh, provides a super clean, uh, really easy to use interface uh, instead of trying to hunt, hunt around for that cable uh, or untangle it or, or whatever the case may be. There's that custom wall plate project we're working on. Uh, and this has been a pain point for me at Washburn for, for a long time in our classroom space. Uh, networking department long, long ago, or, or ITS rather, you know, long ago has standardized on the Ortronics uh, Series 2 uh, wall plates, which are these like, um, and in an off-white color, they have these like clip-in little inserts for network. There's a dual network, you know, there's a bunch of, bunch of different options, but that is our yeah, that is our standard across campus. Uh, and Ortronics makes a HDMI insert for the for that series uh, in that off-white color. You can see kind of kind of what it looks like here in that in this big printed plate. Uh, but with the adapter, you know, with the uh, female female adapter that's on there, there was never enough room to get it to the uh, a cable plugged in and then bent up the cable mold or, or into the wall or whatever the case may be or up into the conduit uh without hurting the hurting the cable or popping that insert out and they're like 45 dollars a piece which is it's like paying a lot of money for a solution that just doesn't work very well uh so, so going on that same idea of using those those pigtails developed a 
uh, first a, a wall plate that was an exact replica, essentially an exact replica of that Series 2 wall plate, uh, but with physical physical connections for those, those pigtails. So now we have a solid AV connection, but but our cabling technicians could still insert their their standard series two off white you know uh, you know uh, inserts. Uh, so instead of running an AV wall plate and a networking wall plate, or a networking wall plate with some very poorly managed AV components, we can run a single wall plate down a single cable mold uh, and serve both purposes. Obviously, it looks a little dumb with a this gray uh, PLA that we were that we were using, but uh, with a with an off white filament, there's a, a lots and lots out there. It would be a uh, this ends up being a a uh, in my opinion near perfect solution uh, because also we can brand it. See that little ITS little little branding, which is kind of cool. We could put an Ichabod there if we wanted to, or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and then the, that center one is HDMI up top with a USB. It's just 2.0 at the, at the bottom there. Uh, and we can design the, the great thing about this is when I was talking about purpose built printing is we can make if we need a wall plate that has three HDMI's, we can do that. If we want a, a two net two series two Artronics plus a USB, we can do that. You know, we can mix and match. Uh, we don't have to be set to. This is the wall plate we buy from from panel crafters or, or whatever, wherever your wall plate vendor is or, or whatever your maybe your integrator has specced out uh, with this. We can uh, provide the exact solution we want, and it's, in my opinion, better than. Going with a custom wall plate from from like a panel crafters, because also um, always at, at Washburn, there's a a cost well at, at everywhere there's a cost factor uh, to consider uh, these design them once we have a folder full of wall plate options we could go back into fusion 360 if we needed something else that was not you know that we hadn't designed yet uh, but really uh, uh, one of my favorite things that we've we've done uh, from the from the 3d printing world is coming up with a something that keeps our old standard but improves upon every other aspect uh, and the uh, the panel mount uh, hdmis i think we pay eight dollars for uh the filament is quite inexpensive for such a small a small thing as a, as a wall plate uh, so a, a panel crafters uh custom wall plate is about 85 dollars a piece or we can get some pre-made ones that don't quite fit the needs uh, for for less a little less than that. Uh, so for uh, very inexpensive, we have a considerably better solution. Here's a uh, a print of a an Oki printer part uh, that broke. You know, a little clip, a little clip to hold. I think it holds in the fuser. I can't exactly remember. It holds in. The toner or the fuser or something something like that but it broke and there was no option to get it replaced uh it you had to buy a, a quite a few like in a whole assembly uh and the assembly was not something that really anybody had in stock or kept so you'd have it was a super long wait time uh this the printer was dead without it uh, we pulled it into three uh, fusion 360. Uh, there's a couple really cool ways to, to model things off of photographs uh, and that's how we did it. We took photographs from the top and the side, the bottom, uh, pulled them all in in sort of a three-dimensional, obviously three-dimensional view, uh, and extruded out the the design. Uh, this top one uh, in this photo with the, the sort of orangey tan that that's the original part. The one in back that's that's version one. It broke almost immediately because uh, of how thin these back parts were. Uh, the second version has been installed for quite some time and as far as I know is, is still running and saved us uh, the downtime uh, and saved us from getting a new printer. This one is certainly there's some asterisks here. Asterisks, I can't say that word, but uh, there are some caveats here about safety. 
this is a projector mount part. Uh, all of our, a lot of our mounts are old and uh, are two in, two inch uh, pipe mounts for real heavy, but big projectors that we have long since moved away from, but the, the mount's still there and is not still is in the right spot, but uh, everything nowadays is, is an inch and a half pipe. So this is actually a, a, a pipe adapter uh, to adapt that two inch uh, NPT uh, pipe thread down to an inch and a half up at the ceiling side. Some of our, our other solution is down at the projector side, we can adapt the two inch pipe that's still there down to inch and a half, down to a little inch and a half nub attached to the projector mount, and it just it looks ugly. There, you know, again, was expensive for these galvanized adapters because uh, what what you're seeing there, two to inch and a half in that direction, it doesn't exist in that Schedule Forty world. Uh, so, so this is heavily over engineered. It's printed solid. It's real thick. Uh, I was standing on the, I was standing on it, not, not in the air, on the ground, I was standing on a projector and just, yeah, you know, just beating the thing up and I couldn't, you know, I have little concerns that, uh, from a safety standpoint, but they are holding very light projectors and they are safety chains. So if anything crazy were to happen, the safety is uh, taken care of. All right, I'm gonna exit out of this. Uh, and turn off presenter view, hopefully. Hey, we got some cool, we, we got some, okay. So I'm going to try to cruise back through the chat uh, just to make sure there's no questions because I was a little blind. I'm, I'm working on a single, single screen uh, laptop here. Greg Ender three, great choice. That's what I. That's one of my printers at home. Uh, that was my first one. I now have a Prusa Mini, uh, which is which is awesome. Um, the one the printer we have at work is a. Uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Creator Max Pro made by Fusion uh, Flash Forge Flash Forge. It's fine. It, it suits our needs. It's very low maintenance. It has two, two extruders, so you can do two types of plastic at the same time, uh, which is really cool. Uh, but it, it was also the one that was available and we got it in three days and it was, and we were able to get printing. So uh, uh, that's what we have at, at Washburn. Uh, some universities, I know you guys have um, printers all around. Uh, pardon me while I read some through some of this. I'm certainly, if I miss something, I'm certainly, uh, filament supplies during COVID super, it was, was not an issue. Uh, when we bought the printer, we bought, uh, we bought enough filament to, uh, accomplish the COVID tasks. Uh, and we've burned through all of that at this point, but, uh, it, it was no problem. It was a little bit longer wait time than the printer printer came in three days. We had the, we had the filament within the week, I think. Uh, a a uh, printing a filament manufacturer that I really enjoy that I use primarily at home and also offers education discounting is a U.S. Uh, based company called 3D Fuel, 3dfuel.com. Uh, they are awesome people. Uh, they make really good uh, filaments and their pro PLA is uh, really uh, quite nice. Okay, still. Eric Crouch, thank you. It was a fuser for a Oki B730. If you guys happen to have an Oki B730 with a broken fuser clip, we can help, which I probably doubt, but, uh, and I probably shouldn't release online. There might be some, anyway, trademark or, you know, some concerns about that. Okay, I'm going over to the Q&A now. Let's see, see what we got. How well do printed objects take uh, take to paint? Uh, 
He takes paint well. Uh, regular paint. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can absolutely paint paint filaments. Um, because of the way 3D printing happens with the layers, you will have layer lines most of the time, especially in like functional prints. We're not really printing at super high resolutions. We're printing uh, at like 0.3 uh, millimeters, which is a 0.3 or, or, or higher. Uh, so you'll have some layer lines. If you can, you can kind of hear, it, it kind of feels like one of those like, uh, uh, you know, images that, you know, lenticular images kind of feels like, like that sort of lens material, but you can absolutely sand it. You can absolutely paint it. You can use uh, a lot of people use 3d printing in a non-commercial world for like miniatures and, and action figures and stuff like that. And they use just model paint, uh, but latex paints are fine. Oil-based paints are fine. Uh, a lot of people use a filling primer, like a spray filling primer to fill in some of those imperfections on, on quicker prints. Uh, Anonymous asked something about uh, weight limits, probably related to that projector one. Uh, there have been, uh, uh, certainly depends a little bit on the filament you're using, but uh, there, there is a filament manufacturer uh, called Polymaker. They had just recently had a competition for people to design 3D printed hooks. Uh, and then they competed against each other and the, the, the design restraint constraints where they had to use, they could only use 50 grams of filament, which is a very small amount. It's probably what this is printed in it, you know, printed uh, with a amount of filament. Uh, and then they pitted them against each other uh, to see who could, you know, make the strongest hook. And the, the winners were often exceeding a one ton of force before the, their hook broke. Uh, there is, I certainly couldn't give you a number because also uh, PLA plastics, uh, they melt at a, a pretty low temperature. So like if you had it outside or in the sun, I've like got like a, something in my car that I printed uh, it, in, in a hot car, it will deform. So there are some concerns there, but you can make very strong things, especially if you get into those fiber reinforced filaments. Um, court, same thing, liability, insurance regarding printing parts, uh, uh, everything that we have that would potentially hurt somebody, uh, is secured in another, uh, is, in, is secured in another fashion. Um, our projector standard, the Epson 2250U is real lightweight. Uh, realistically, I don't have any concerns with it. Uh, the, the printed map, you know, all those threaded adapters uh, having any uh, problems, but those are also safety chained as well uh, with a, they include a, a, a safety cable. Uh, so if, if that were uh, some reason to um, fail or come loose, um, it would not hurt anybody. Um, I will, I'm gonna take a quick look. Craig, it looks like John was trying to uh, respond to some of your questions. I'm going to read through this real quick. Oh, yes, Craig, absolutely. Uh, uh, 3D printed par you know, parts, you know, enclosures and stuff like that for Raspberry Pis, Arduinos. That, there's a t you, you probably don't even need to design one. Uh, y y your own uh, in those in those instances there are hundreds and hundreds of Raspberry Pi cases to fit every need I had a need for uh, I'm using a uh, this is not uh, Washburn related but personal use I have a Wemo D1 mini which is a, a, a little you know pr programmable control board uh, with a, a relay of uh, shield stacked on top of it I found you know somebody had already designed that exact part uh, so I just pieced it all together uh, from an AV control standpoint, uh, we actually, I actually designed a, uh, a tabletop mount similar to that ClearCom mount that I showed in the uh, ClearCom uh, intercom tabletop mount and for a Crestron button panel uh, that we used up at our front desk for a, a, a short time. Uh, we, we were controlling our locked door with it for a, a silly reason, but uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you can design, you know, as long as it can fit on your print bed or, or uh, you can design it. I see no, no qualms with 
3D printed stuff uh, out in the wild uh, for such a thing. Uh, there's actually, if you guys have click shares anywhere on campus, there's a really great uh, click share button holder uh, that somebody designed. It mounts on a wall or whatever, I mount with foam tape, and it holds two buttons. It says click share. It's super easy, and, and uh, I printed those for, for everywhere we have uh, click shares. Uh, any other questions before I think we're out of time? Uh, are we building? I've tried other. I've never used SketchUp. I've used a Tinkercad, which is sort of like uh, one of the beginner. A lot of times the beginner option, you know, is, is Tinkercad because it's super easy. Um, I just dove right into Fusion because a lot of people were recommending it and I saw that we can get it for free. So I just dove right into that. Uh, but SketchUp, a lot of people use it. Um, I've done some stuff in Mesh Mixer and in uh, Blender, but those are uh, a little more for like organic objects and stuff like that. Um, building larger items, uh, not really. Uh, I've built some, designed some bigger stuff for home use. Um, uh, for some uh, home use stuff, because uh, I've got you know a little bit bigger print bed than than ours at work, uh, and and uh, yeah, people can make great things in Tinkercad. Uh, uh, I just uh, just went the one direction and trying to dove in uh, head first uh, when I when I first got into printing. Okay, any other questions? I'm not sure. Think time is over. If you guys want to hang around, uh, sure. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, send me any some personal questions, or uh, you can certainly email me uh, or find me any, on any of those uh, uh, platforms. Uh, I certainly love uh, chatting with anybody about any of this. I actually don't know how to stop. <laughs> this presentation <laughs> uh, yeah sorry if I blew through everything it was kind of bizarre having not seeing you know people interacting or, or things like that so uh, and I get a little excitable so so if you anybody wants any uh, present you know uh, uh, clarification on anything uh, feel free to reach out And I still don't know how to end this, so I'm just going to hang out here for a minute. I, I was planning to print a little check 2020 thing, a 2021 thing, uh, uh, to have printing, you know, in a picture-in-picture -picture sort of thing uh, as a timer for me, but it didn't it didn't work out. I'm selling my house tomorrow. Anyway, we'll be right back. I'm going to go get a lightsaber. Lightsaber, Ocarina. Yeah, court or anybody, feel free to. I think you can. I don't know how you hop in, but you know, apparently, uh, but uh, I think you can message me on here or. Uh, Feel free to, there's my email. I'm basically at ecarlson88, whatever, on, on all of the printing things and all the social medias and all that. So so uh, you can find me that way as well, uh, or on LinkedIn, that, that kind of thing. As John mentioned, uh, I am leaving shortly, but uh, uh, leaving Washburn shortly, but you, we're in a digital world. I'm available everywhere. Okay, I'm turning off my camera and mic. I absolutely don't know how to leave this thing. I found it, everybody. There's a leave button. <laughs>